All right, another draft physics video presentation. Draft science here on YouTube. Anyway, uh, wish I could afford to live alone edition. Yes. People are irritating. Anyway, um, <clears throat> speaking of irritating, so uh, more two slit stuff, I think. We'll just go over it one more time, sort of. Uh, just new observations, just minor ones. Whoops, didn't mean to do that at all. Just want to read what it says here below. If you can explain this using common sense and logic, okay, uh, do let me know. Well, there's no way to let you know uh, because there is a Nobel Prize for you. So, again, the argument is is that uh, almost a 11 year old could do it. Um, you know, in terms of pointing out how there's a logical explanation, you don't have to do this crazy wooey. Uh, whatever this wave stuff oh, that's gonna play even though I didn't I didn't ask it to do that anyway all right so I'll pause and go to the drawing board and such all right should be back um, <clears throat> all right so what I have um, attempted to explain is that waves are you know emergent things they're not necessarily anything that you need to see as elemental. So the simple argument is, is that if I did create a scatter, if there was some circumstance that made something um, change its path, so it's going straight, there's some sort of obstacle, like electrons or something, and the obstacles make it do something. And so one time it goes out this way, the next time it goes out that way, and that uh, would create what could be called a wave in the sense that it would look like it could. If you took a time-lapse picture of the bullets, right, you shot different bullets through something and it's a little bit of an obstacle and they come out kind of funky, and you took a time-lapse photo and it's randomized, there's enough variables that it's all randomized, it could look like that, okay? It could look like something like, um, you know, there's stuff at all these locations at the same time. Like one time it's there, one time it's there, one time it's there, but they're all equidistant, so it's all the same speed and all the same everything else, and all you've changed is the direction. And yes, you could say, well, that's a wave front. But, you know, it's sort of not a wave in any traditional sense of the word wave, where these little bits are connected to each other and they're kind of, you know, like water or some other medium, where the wave is being created because the little bits are connected to each other. So clearly something particle-esque could make something that looks like a wave. Now, looks like isn't necessarily is like, as I've attempted to point out. So the logic would be is that you're, you should be um, aware of that. And therefore, logically, if you're going to do logic to explain something, well, yeah, the logic would first tell you, don't be fooled just because something looks like something doesn't mean it is something. And so I've pointed out that in the double slit or the single slit or any of the slit experiments, what you really have are two surfaces or four surfaces, or a million surfaces, and that the surfaces are creating the wave, and so uh, what you're calling a wave, and that really, though, the surface is just scattering, so it's just causing the little bits of what you're calling a photon to go different places, so it's a thing that happens over time, the photon is I'm arguing a composite object just made of little bits they <coughs> are at a frequency and each one takes a different path each one goes to a different place in time so this one goes here and this one goes over here and this one goes over there all at a different time and sequence so you could say okay there's a wave there and a wave there and a wave there and a wave there if you want to play wave but you don't need to play it. So the simple argument is, is their own math acknowledges the truth. It's right there in their own math. Their own math says loud and clear, this is all about the surfaces because the distance in their math is the distance between the surfaces. 
So if I make the single impediment experiment instead, what distance is going to be in there? Ah, it's going to be the distance between the surfaces. And it's the distance between the surfaces is where the center of the action is. So even if you want to believe it, it's waves, you have to accept that the waves are going to be here and here. That's the center of the wave. The center of the wave. That's what the math is saying. That's what this variable is saying loud and clear. Is that the center of the wave, the center of the point where you're going to make vectors that are going to equal your wave, are coming from the surfaces, okay? They're not coming from here. That doesn't work. One wave from the middle doesn't work. That doesn't create a pattern, okay? So if you want to have the pattern, you have to make two waves. And you have to, you can't place them in here. This distance won't give you the right answer. This distance is the wrong answer. This is the right answer. This is where the wave has to be. And putting the waves there, you can understand, doesn't make any sense. There's no good reason for the wave to break here, right? Your waves are coming in. No good reason for them to break right in the middle of the opening. And certainly no good reason for them to go through the, the substance and then start bending. So none of that <clears throat> works. It's clearly illogical. It doesn't fit the evidence, uh, and it just makes a horrendous mess. All right, so then there's the other experiment, you know, where you have more than one slit, more than one contributor. So then <clears throat> it gets a little bit more complicated, uh, and the pattern is likewise a little more complicated. So with two slits, um, you'd say, oh, this is what they draw, wave here, wave here. That math doesn't work. Putting the distance here doesn't work. They still have to use this distance for part of the equation. And what they say is, is these slits have to be less than a wavelength opening for their math to work. <laughs> now, obviously, the wider you make it, the more pattern you get, the more interesting the whole thing gets. So why that kind of crazy limitation? Their math should work no matter what the width of the slits is. But part of the key is, is their short version of the math doesn't even care about this distance and this distance. It doesn't care how wide the slits are. And when they do better math, okay, to get the right answer, that's exactly what's in the equation again. The distance is, there's four distances, you know, four surfaces. And the four surfaces are all creating a wave, if you want to look at it that way. Again, I, I, I hate to have to keep bending my rhetoric to you, but you're so insistent, you know, that you can't see it any other way. These are scatter points. That's all it is. They're scatter points. Bits of photon are going in different directions each time one goes through. Each individual little bit of the, the photon, you know the photon's a wave, if right? You're saying it's a wave. Well, you're saying the wave has distances. It's a timed event. A piece of it goes through, then another piece of it goes through, then another piece of it goes through, then another piece of it goes through. And you know that some, <clears throat> some combination of a number of pieces, let's say at least two, um, must successfully navigate the experiment to create what we call a photon. Now, I would argue it has to be more than that because the polarization of the photon is really large, which indicates more than one atom has to be involved. I mean, it's a thousand atoms of polarization. More than one atom has to be involved in its creation and is in its reception. You can't receive a photon without enough atoms, and you can't um, produce one without enough atoms. And that's clearly stated by the fact that it is polarized, and that polarization is consistent over space and time doesn't matter how far I shoot the photon, it's always got the same polarization. It doesn't change. Uh, red light has uh, got a bigger polarization than blue light, just like uh, microwaves have a bigger uh, polarization than radio waves, I mean a smaller uh, polarization. So just to the higher the frequency, the smaller the polarization. The two are correlated to each other because they're both being created by the speed of light, as I've pointed out. So anyway, scatter is the simple logical explanation. The bits scatter, then now we're going to talk about what we're going to see.
Well, if we're going to talk about what we're going to see, the we don't really want to be seeing on a flat plane because that's not exactly how the the image travels through space. So just like it doesn't do you much good, um, you know. To, I mean, the, the correlation would be a a uh, you know. <clears throat> see, it does it works okay with film because of the fact that we often use lenses but you'll get distortion so you can understand if you project a movie wide on a wide screen that you would have to compensate for the fact that the light has to travel much further to get to the edges of the screen <laughs> okay and that it's going to not only take more time for it to get there but this is such a longer distance you know than this distance you know but there any pattern is going to get stretched the further and further out you go and so logically you can kind of understand that you're sort of cheating the experiment by broadcasting it on a flat screen flat screens aren't ideal now the truth is that this experiment is so far away you know the screen uh, we're magnifying it so much that you're not going to be bothered too much for most of what you're going to see you're not going to see the distortion but it is in fact there now the other trick is a trick I just recently realized um, is that a curved screen it isn't just simple oh it's just a circle it happens to be that it turns into a, a um, ellipse <laughs> okay because you're really taking two focuses and in this experiment you have four focuses right I mean you have four points <clears throat> that you're going to um, analyze as sources and the simple argument is, is the pattern is just being created by multiplying the sources. So two sources is good, three sources is a lot better, four sources is even better. So if you can get all four to be in phase, all four to have um, the right phase, uh, what's the right word for it? I mean, it's not like they have to all be at the same moment in time. They have to be in the right order in time. And so, obviously, you can have one come from a different time and travel a longer distance, or you can have one come at the same time and travel different, different distances. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you can have them come at different times and travel the same distance, or you can have them like this one and this one could have, <clears throat> um, could send bits but one bit came at a different time than this one came. So this one came a wavelength later, it hit here. And then they would end up hitting here in phase. You know, this, the one that came later traveled the same distance, but it came a phase later, a wavelength later in time. Uh, you can't see that. So that wasn't very useful. Sorry. Got to remember to stay within the boundaries. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we'll go back to the single slit just because it makes the mathematics a little bit easier, but just understand it's more about surfaces. So when I say single slit, what am I really saying? The two source experiment. That's what the single slit is. It's two sources. So you have your single slit and what you have here and what's special about this distance is that there's a number of wavelengths in it. All right, and it's not necessarily an even number, which is also important. But you have two sources. And what all you're really doing is saying, what are those two sources going to do if I draw vectors? Where are the lines where the wavelength difference, they have that wavelength of difference in the length of the line. So the simple way to analyze it is just to draw two lines, one line and another line from the two sources. All right. And now all you're going to say is, is, what's the difference between those two lines is this number of wavelengths. Now, if I take that distance, no, I know what's going to happen. If I, as I, let's say I just make this a string, okay? So it's one piece of string at zero degrees. And I know my wavelengths are going to be on that one piece of string. So if I just take this part, this distance, and I just put the notches of these wavelengths on that distance, Right? I know that's telling me what I'm going to have here. Now, let's say that there's an odd, neat, odd number of wavelengths in this distance. So the number comes out to say 10.5. That's telling you right away that you're at a 0.5 here. 
that you're exactly a half wavelength of um, you know distance difference you know in these in these string lengths in this this length versus this length is a number of wavelengths plus one half of a wavelength different so you know that they can't be in phase they have to be out of phase so you know this is going to be a dark all right now you're just saying okay I'm starting with a pure dark if it's 0.5 then I know it's exactly on the dark so right here I know my image is dark that's a dark spot and so now I know I'm just going to start making light spots and dark spots going in this arc now the key to this is is like I said there's two focuses so as I'm doing this experiment I'm really just going to I'm going to create a parabola I'm not going to create a, a circle but the parabola gets less and less a parabola the further the longer I make the radiuses the smaller this distance becomes relative to it and the less and less you'll be able to see that it's a parabola so for the sake of argument when you're talking about 10 meters of distance here and one millimeter of distance here the parabola is so slight that it can't make much difference you're not going to see any of it so the simple argument is is as I move towards this 90 degree point you know of the center all right where these two line up all right well we know there's equal distance there so we know two things for sure we know the pattern is off here okay it's out of phase and we know it's for certain in phase here uh, you can uh, uh rather than redraw well well not even quite enough well that's about as far as i can go all right <clears throat> so we know this is in phase here all right yeah you can see enough of that and we know this is out of phase here and now it's just a matter of moving these strings so if this was a string we would just move the string we'd put a little little nail in here or something to just glide over here and so the two strings will tell us now the notches will tell us so i put notches on the string and they're going to tell us how many notches where the notches where we hit a notch that'll be a bright and then that'll be a bright and 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 we know where we're in the middle of two notches like right here when we look at the string if it's in the middle of the notches we know that's a dark and that's a dark and that's going to be a dark and that's going to be a dark because we know from these two sources that's going to be the path length difference of the lines and the trick is when we get up here what do we have well we have half of the notches have gone around okay so now half the notches are on one side half the notches are on this side so that's what we have here is right in between the two and the irony is we had a 0.5 number right let's say we had a 10.5 well we know half of, of that is going to be 5.25 how can 5.25 that's not a whole number of wavelengths how can that be a bright that's completely broken and that's exactly what it is it's completely broken that's an aberration that's being caused because now you're moving both vectors into each other rather than two both vectors going in the same direction now they're going in opposite directions so this whole little part within this one millimeter is a false it's fake it's phony it doesn't have anything to do with the reality yes it will be a bright right here but only be a bright for one millimeter right and we're talking these notches now on this board might be you know an inch or more uh, might be two inches thick so this tiny millimeter isn't going to be very visible in causing any real effect but it's a, it's a millimeter of light and, and with laser light that millimeter is going to mean something so that bright is just a fake though the real on wavelength is you know at five this is where the real bright is and this is where the real other bright is this is a fake so this is five okay and this is where six is so, you know the sixth notch so if i really had 10.5 you know you're going through here and now you're at 5.25 well it's five over here and it's six over here so this is where the for, the real brights are right so you have to go based on starting at zero and then going through and you'll just see this is a fake one here okay it's it's 
it's saying that it's the same wave, the same path length, and yet the number doesn't indicate the notch is wrong, but the notch really can't be wrong, <laughs> you know, and it's only wrong because of this, where we've changed the circumstance. On this side, both the lines are going this way. On this side, both the lines are going this way. And here, inside of this one millimeter, ah, we have both lines going in opposite directions. So it's a fake, a false, a phony right. And that's why this middle pattern ends up being looking like two, is because it is two. There's a bright over here, and there's a bright over here, and there's this fake one that's filling in the middle. And so it looks like there's two there. Um, you know, there, there's one, one blob that's the size of two. And, um, but it's really, it can be variant anywhere from a little under two to a little over two in terms of what it can look like based on whether you have this remainder or not. Um, if you don't have the remainder, then it can look like just a little bit more than one. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, if you're right on being perfect, if, if you're, their distance is exactly an uh, even number of wavelengths, then this will look right because you will, the, the 5 will be right here. Say if it was 10, exactly 10 wavelengths. It's exactly 10 wavelengths, I don't where you can see it, um, <clears throat> then 5 would be right here in the middle. So you would expect there to be a blob there. You'd expect that to be a center. Um, but it only happens when you're exactly, and the odds are you're not going to be exact. You're only going to be exactly right one out of 99% of the time kind of thing. It's much easier to have the remainder than it is to be exactly the right wavelength. Exactly. All right. Uh, so that's the only changes, really, from what I've told you said before, is that the number, it's on a parabola, so there is a slight difference in that these blobs at this end will be slightly different size than the blobs at this end, but it's such a slight parabola that it doesn't make enough difference in terms of a gross estimate. You know, it's not going to change much. Um, very slight um, change in what you're going to get as results. And again, this string thing just works because it guarantees your path length, wavelength difference. It shows you. It just makes it visual. So you don't have to do any sine thetas and all this other stuff. You can just, you know, you can just have it physically proven to you. This is a wavelength difference. This is a wavelength difference. It'll prove it to you. It's physically proven. Um... So again, all these are always, look, they are always drawing these straight line vectors from points. So again, you know, it, it has, it looks like a scatter. It, it, it looks like particles. It quacks like particles. It walks like particles. They draw it like particles. The mass says particles. And again, for some reason, you're insisting, you want to insist that there's waves in these preposterously silly locations. Don't make any sense. Because again, the math won't work if you put them here. You'll get the wrong answer. You won't get the right placement of the bars of light. And you certainly won't be able to explain this center. Waves won't create that fake center. All right, that fake center is being created because it is particles. Um, all right, what else do I need to say? Uh, so anyway, so the double slit <coughs> is just the same basic dynamic again. You're just but you're combining four sources instead of two sources, and there's different ways you can look at it. But I mean, the simplest I think way to look at it is you're just looking for distances. Distances are putting those lines on the strings, and you sort of know that you're just looking for the smallest distance. Where are the two surfaces the closest together? And where are the two surfaces the furthest away from each other? Because you know that there's a correlation. The number of wavelengths between the sources is what's going to decide how many places it's in phase. So this wide distance creates lots of places where we're in phase, right? And this small distance only creates, well, one here, one here, one here. All right, so the small distance is creating this pattern. The big distance is creating the little pattern. And you can just add them up that way and say, well, when all four sources, okay, are in phase, 
So if I have a string from here and here, and I have a string from here and here, and they both notch at this location, I'll have a bright spot. And you just go through it just like that. Now you can just take one of these strings out and do the same thing with just three strings. All right, it's a little more complicated, but the fact is, is that'll create a bright two. Or, you know, I could take that one off and just do this source. So three <clears throat> means you have a higher odds of creating the pattern you're looking for, the photon being reconstructed. Four sources, even more chance, blah, blah, blah. And um, so again, it's you're trying to put things in order, you know, like A, B, C. <clears throat> and obviously, the more sources you create, the more likely it is you're going to create that combination. And so there's like a four times. You know, you double the sources, you quadruple the amount of possible matches to the pattern. And um, so that's the simple way of understanding it. This, the, the small distance is creating the envelope pattern. The big dis distance is creating the little bars inside. And its call can be understood just because of the fact that we know photons aren't seeing surfaces. So again, understand, just use your imagination for a second. Think of yourself being really, really tiny, a photon. A little tiny thin thing you know you're really thin there's a piece of paper well I can use sponge all right you're really thin but you're tall okay and you're just made out of little elements you only got four or five little bits to you and you're flying through space and you're really really tiny much smaller than an atom in terms of the little bits the components of you what are they seeing when they see a surface they're not seeing some flat surface. They're not seeing some all or nothing. They're seeing a complex environment full of, you know, planets, so to speak, and asteroids and stuff. They're seeing, they're seeing a lot of empty space with a few little components in it that mean either attract me or they're going to deflect me. And so as I'm traveling, I'm going to get deflected by electrons. Uh, well, I'm going to hit them, actually. <laughs> I can't be deflected by anything because I'm a photon. See, electrons will be deflected by electrons. But they don't do the real two slit with electrons. That's a lie. It, it's no, there's no slits involved. Anyway, um, the photon is it travels near the surface. You can understand it's a complex environment, and the photon's going to hit some electrons. And when photons hit electrons, they push them, and the electron then releases the photon in some other new location because it's it shoots it, it scatters it, it changes its direction. It absorbs some of its energy. The energy comes in, the electron fiddles about a little bit, and then it reabsorbs the energy. And it can reabsorb the energy in any one of these locations. And if it hits two electrons or three electrons, well, then you know it's going to likely be bent pretty good. Um, and that's what's causing the, the fact that at every moment of time from these surfaces a bit goes this way and then a bit goes that way and then a bit goes this way and a bit goes that way so they're hitting every place on this thing everywhere is getting hit by little bits and all we're really doing is calculating well what's the possibility of a, of a path you could take that puts you back in the right timing to make a photon where either your arrival time means you'll be in the right location or the distance you have to travel will put you in the right location so you can either change your arrival time or you can change the path you have to travel and those either one of those two combinations will lead to you being in the right location to create a pattern you know this the the frequency needed the consistent frequency needed what's happening in between where the dark spots are there's the same number of photons, the same amount of energy is going to the dark spots. It's just going there, it's hitting there in out of sequence. Okay, it has to be a frequency. It has to be consistent for more than two or three of these <clears throat> events. And each one of the events has to have the right amount of time between them. And if it's the wrong amount of time, you can't see it. Your, our receivers, our eyes, all the other mechanisms that receive photons can't receive it. Just like if I have a radio signal and I screw it up and it's 200 megahertz here and it's 500 megahertz here, radio receiver isn't going to be able to detect it. It's not going to be able to, you can't send a radio signal that way and get it. 
receive it and do anything with it. So it becomes invisible. The energy's still there. It just can't see it as a photon anymore. Now it's just going to make heat or something else, but it's not going to do what the photon does. And clearly they really should do the experiment that way. They should. <laughs> I'm surprised no one's done it. But they should photograph in infrared and see <clears throat> if how dramatic the difference is between the light and the dark spots in terms of you know the bands versus the places that you know there's no light and just see if <clears throat> this is radiating just as much infrared radiation is theoretically uh, it would make sense that it would it's getting just as hot as the parts that are getting hit by the real photons theoretically I mean, it gets a little complicated getting into transmission versus, uh, you know, the fact is that many surfaces will just transmit um, infrared radiation. So you won't get the reflections you need to be able to see the difference. Uh, but theoretically, uh, there's different ways of measuring it. They could actually measure it with a, a temperature detector and just not even bother measuring uh, photons, but just measure temperature at these different locations and see if there's any difference in the temperature uh, the, the overt radiation something that detects all forms of radiation um, as heat generally generally speaking um, there's detectors like like phosphorescent materials, right? You can use that to detect. Well, it'll it'll react to you know gamma rays. It'll react to X rays. It'll like, uh, react to electrons. Lots of different forms of energy will cause it to fluoresce. So detectors like that uh, can be used to generalize and figure out whether you have any energy in a system. All right. So is that enough? So yeah, it's it's deducible with just time. You just spend a little time looking at the double slit and you can clearly see, like I said, this isn't, the all these wave people should concede, there's nothing spectacularly special about a wave and you're just, you know, and even in like Maxwell's charge equations, you know, you're, the, you draw these lines to indicate that the strength of the field is the same, okay? And you're just basically saying this is this is the inverse square law that these things are these forces are spreading with distance, but of course you could draw a line here and just say look at this is the equidistant line and this is the next equidistant line, and this is the and it can start to look like a wave, but there's no wave, all right? It really is stuff going in a direction from here, and there's really stuff going in a direction from here, and it's not going all of these places at once. No, at each moment of time, there's a piece going here, and in another moment of time, it's going here, and in another moment of time, it's going here. Um, and it's not a wave. It's force emanating, reflecting off of something. I mean, you kind of know, don't you? I, mean, well, I can keep saying it, and you're just, you're just not going to pay any attention. If I, made the, if I put a bunch of sand in the universe and I shot it at the earth, constantly shot it with sand from all locations and the sand bounced off <clears throat> you'd know it could look like a wave right you could know that the amount of sand coming off would be a certain amount and that, that there, I could create surfaces on the earth like a mountain <clears throat> and that would create defects in the reflection <laughs> you know and it could look wavy like but there really wouldn't be anything wavy and I could shove the sand in at a frequency. I could say, here's a bunch of sand and then no sand, and then a bunch of sand and then no sand, and then a bunch of sand and no sand. And if I saw the sand coming out that same way, I shouldn't be hugely surprised. I shouldn't say, well, that's wave mechanics. No, that's just the fact is, if you, anything can be at a frequency. Frequency is not um, something that has to be part of a wave. Lots of things have frequency that aren't waves. Again, bullets, soldiers, tons of things I can send out <clears throat> that have a frequency but have nothing to do with waving. All right. That'll have to do, I think. Well, that's enough. I'm a bit sick and tired of everything. And... 
<laughs> yeah, just uh, maybe I'll sleep through a few days. Uh, but I have to endeavor to persevere. So I'll try to do that and such. So, till the next time. Again, I can just reason with you. If you're unreasonable, you're unreasonable. I can't, what am I going to do? Short of you know, <laughs> violence, what, what, what choice do I have? I can't force you to pay attention. I can't force you to concede the truth. Their theories are way under evidenced, and there are simple, logical explanations. You don't need to believe in all of this wooey, gremlin crap. <laughs>